<laughs> it could be. It could it's, be. It's, it's happened okay. before. This is a technical conference scheduled for docket number 24057-04, Dominion Energies Utah yeah, you, Integrated good, Research good. Plan for the planning year of June 1st, 2024 to May 31st, 2025. My name is Melinda Cranville, and I am the PESC's facilitator for this conference. So let's start with the introductions. I'm Jennifer Clark. I am counsel for Dominion Energy. Abby Thomas with Dominion Energy. Brandy Robles, Dominion Energy. Uh, Will Schwarzbach, Manager of Gas Supply with Dominion Energy. Richard Kaiser with Dominion Energy. John Delaney with the Public Service Commission. Yvonne Hope with Public Service Commission. John Harvey, uh, Commission. Eric Martinson, Commission. Sean Lee, Commission. Jordan Stevenson with Dominion Energy. Abdinazar Avil Abdullah with the Division. Uh, Matt Pernicoli with the Division. Casey Coleman with the Division of Public Utilities. Jeff Einfeld with the Division. Doug Wheelwright with the Division. Austin Summers with Dominion Energy. Patrick Greek, AAG representing the Division. Tyler McIntosh with the Division. Kelly Mendenhall with Dominion. Eric Orton with the Division. Jacob Zachary with OCS. Alex Ware with OCS. Brenda Salter with the Division. And no one's still on the phone? Okay. Make it away. All right, I'm going to kick things off here, just welcoming everyone to our next IRP technical conference. Where do I have to point this to make it? Uh... Yeah, he got it. Oh, we got it. There we go. Uh, so today is March 19th. We've already had uh, one prior meeting on February 15th, uh, where we went over the standards and guidelines and the order. Uh, we did a quick pricing update and uh, talked a little bit about our, about our supply <coughs> sourcing, where it came from. Today we're going to talk about system integrity, rural expansion, uh, our transportation and storage planning, so kind of that long, longer term look, and some um, updates on our supply modeling. Then we're going to have two more meetings, uh, one in April, the end of April, one uh, the 1st of May, and then uh, we'll submit our IRP in uh, early June and we'll go over it in, it looks like, uh, July 8th. So uh, I'm going to turn it over right away. Thing is not working. What am I doing wrong? Is it not on? Turning it on helps. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to turn it over to Richard Kaiser, who will have a turned on thing and talk about system integrity. Thanks, Will. Um, so I'm going to actually start with uh, talking about just kind of budgetary items first here, looking at this table. So, what we're projecting to spend for integrity management between the transmission and the distribution programs. Uh, is approximately 10, $10.3 million. Um, we are starting to see some costs uh, increase as we've had to go out and rebid some of our um, projects and rebid some of our contracts uh, that, that were bid back in 2020, 2021. Uh, so we're seeing some cost increase there. Uh, we're also seeing some cost increase over the years as you're seeing 2024, 2025, and 2026. Well, uh, that's primarily due just to the inspection cycle so just as an example, in 2024, we have five inline inspection projects. In 2020, 2025, we have six. And in 2024, or sorry, 2020, too many sixes and fours here. In 2026, we're dropping back down to four. So that's kind of just a repeat over every six years, those lines get <coughs> inspected. And so the mileage increase and decrease depending on which line we're looking at. And so, um, there's more mileage being being inspected in 2025 and so there's a higher dollar amount associated with that uh, and there's some variance with the challenge of different projects and different lines of inspecting um, so that's kind of the the drivers behind some of those cost increases and the variances over year to year any questions on any of that so most of them is the ili Increase there's there's time. also some ECDA mileage that increases and varies as well just the <coughs> is just an example of some of the changes what is ILI and ECDA? So, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> ILI is inline inspection. It's when we put a pig inside the pipeline and we push it with gas, or it might be robotic and we'll crawl through part of the pipeline. Provides an inspection of uh, dents, anomalies, out around this, wall loss uh, on the pipe. So, it gives us a condition of the pipeline that we're able to then go back and we do digs at certain locations to verify the data and information. 
ECDA is another assessment tool that we have in our, in our bag of tricks, so to speak, for assessing the pipeline. This is done by looking at the electronic current with, through our cathodic protection systems in order to maintain and protect the pipeline from corrosion. So we're going along above the line, measuring that current and the changes using special tools and techniques, looking for where that changes to help identify breaks in the coating, potential locations of external corrosion on the pipeline. So uh, between those two tools, those are the primary methods where we assess the pipelines, looking for and verifying that the pipeline is in good condition and safe to continue to operate. Are these uh, multi-year contracts that you have with the vendors or are they rebid every year or what? So depending on the different types of contracts, we have a contractor that helps us do the work. Um, that's usually a three to four year contract. So we've had those out over an extended period of time. Uh, the company that helps us perform the external corrosion direct assessment is also a longer term three, four year contract. Um, the particular vendors that supply us tools and equipment, those are bid usually on a project by project basis. So the smart tool vendors, depending on um, Availability, particular threats we need to assess, challenges of the pipeline, uh, those, those are kind of some of the uh, factors that go into the selection of those vendors. Anything else? Okay. All right, the uh, bullet points are just kind of a touch on some of the regulations that are still in the pipeline. We've kind of got through all of the uh, mega rule. Um, Changes, those were all implemented. The last effective date was just this past February. So all the changes for there have been completed. These are kind of in the pipeline. Uh, the Pipes Act from Congress in 2020 is the driver behind the three I'm gonna talk about. The gas pipeline leak detection rule, we're expecting to see some impacts um, from that. Not too big, but that should go into effect. The projection from PHMSA is later this year, fourth quarter. Most likely class location will follow probably sometime in the first half of 2025. And then the last one, the safety of gas distribution pipelines, which will have a larger impact than the other two on the integrity program, specifically the distribution program, is projected right now to probably be sometime in 2026. So those are kind of the upcoming regulations that are currently in the pipeline that PIMS is working on. Any questions on any of those? Sorry, yeah. So are you talking, when you say class location, are you talking like the high density sort of NHCA? Is that what you mean by class so location? So class location is, um, it's separate from HCAs, but it is related. Oh. So it does impact integrity management with some of the updates from the mega rule in that we are now required to inspect all class three and class four locations in addition to HCAs along with some other caveats. Oh. So the class location is going to be an update to an existing rule that's been around longer than integrity management, where basically it requires us to classify the lengths of different sections of the pipeline based on population around it. So it's very similar to HCA in what it's doing, but HCA is more refined and sits on top of, so to speak, class locations. Any other questions? With, with the update of the emergency response plan, is that provided to the division or others? Um, so that we have that, or is that just Since it's internal? still being developed, I don't know all of the specific details on that yet, Casey, but... Well, once it's done, I'm just wondering if there will be yeah, a copy that we can It's just updates to requirements okay. on what we have to have. Okay. All right, so just an update on kind of the work that we've completed through the integrity programs. Uh, specifically, this is talking on the transmission. So in 2023, um, and, and that's the change from what we presented last year. Uh, we completed 81.1 miles of transmission was assessed. Um, within that, that assessment, there was 8.8 miles of HCA. Again, we, for, for example, when we do an inline inspection or we pick the pipeline that's from point A to point B, um, so part of that line is going to be transmission and a portion of that's going to be HCA. So that's why you see a difference in 88 miles and then down to 8.8 .8 miles. So that's basically a higher consequence or a higher population density. Um, and then the other thing that might catch your attention is the anomalies uh, repaired um, initially at the beginning of the program was, was higher and went down through the years and we we're starting to see that increase a little bit. Uh, what that is reflective of is that we've uh, made a pretty good push in the last uh, three to five years to try and increase the amount of the system that you can actually put a pig in uh, and assess using those techniques. Um, and so that's assessing a wider 
part of the pipeline. So what you're basically seeing is improvements in the program, uh, finding some other anomalies in the system. So um, I take that as being a success in the program and the efforts that we've made to make more of the line inspectable with an inline inspection. So any questions on that? Okay, I'll turn it over to Austin. That's it for me. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, before I start, I know that there's one glaring question, so to speak, and that is, you know, was there a certain hairdo requirement required for presenters today? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't intentional. Short and shiny. Yeah. yeah. It's an initiation process. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I just want to talk about where we're at with rural expansion right now. There's, um, there's a few projects that are going on, and then I'll fill you in kind of on where, where we're looking at going forward. So Eureka was the first program we started. They've had 326 service lines in, signed up and installed. There's still some meters that need to be installed out there. Um, on Eureka, that is our first, since that was our first project, it is the first one that has reached that first two-year window. So if you remember, there's there's a time from when gas goes into into service in that community. They have two years to sign up for a service line to get it at no cost. So Eureka passed that that first two year window uh, last fall, last winter. I think it was November or December. So from now on, anybody who gets a service line in Eureka will have to pay normal tariff rates for that service line. Those meters that are still outstanding, uh, some of those people still have that second two-year window because they have two years after they sign up for service to become a customer. So they've got their service line, but they still need to get their homes ready and, and get a, a meter installed. So uh, Eureka is still is still progressing. And, Question uh, on that. Yeah. What if they never do the meter? So the they will be paying a lot for propane. But other than that, um, the, the contract that they sign says that if they don't sign up and, and get a meter, then they would have to come back and pay for the service line that, that was installed. So there is an incentive for them. And it's not even saying they have to have their whole home ready to go, but if they have a meter, one appliance that's ready to go, that could be a furnace, could be a water heater. Uh, um, it could be an outdoor patio heater, if that's what they really want. I mean, I think there's a benefit for them to to get their homes ready, and and I know that our that our sign up reps have been reinforcing that. Like, you really do need to get this meter installed, or else you'll have to pay for that service. On Eureka, how many people did you originally project would sign up? I think the original. It was either 340 or 360. It's pretty close. Yeah. It was, I mean, for rate making, it was <laughs> <laughs> pretty close. Um, but but I mean, when I was talking to the sign up reps and saying, you know, or you know, should we push this? Are there more out there? And they're like, everybody who's going to sign up could sign up, has signed up. Like they've talked with everybody. They seem to know what's going on out there, and they okay. said that's that's all that we that we get. I don't remember the Goshen one, how many we had projected out there, but um, it seems like it's it's pretty close to what we put out there too. So you've got three twenty six that have signed up for a meter, and two hundred fifty one who have had it installed. So they've signed so up for a service line, and we've installed their service line. And then when their house is ready to be connected, then they'll get a meter. So you're looking at, am I seeing these right? You're looking at about 75 more that need to get a meter that have that are in that pipeline. That's right. Right. And and depending on when they signed up, that could be um, still what a year and a half that they would have left. Um, Goshen, Alberta, I think, is making good progress. Uh, we've, we've still got people out there that are signing up, people getting people connected to the system there. Green River just came online last winter, so I'm actually um, pretty happy with 58 that, that signed up. 
Um, what we've been seeing is that they usually will finish out that first winter, empty their propane tank, and then when it's time, that's a good time to, to switch over to natural gas. So um, some good results there. Genola just got approved, um, and so we, we canvassed the area last week, and uh, we're, I don't think we have any numbers to really report there yet, but we're getting people notified that it's there and available. Yeah. So Genola just is the population about the same as the others? It was. Um, so you would expect somewhere in that same ballpark. Yeah. I'm estimating then. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a little bit smaller. It might have been closer to three hundred. Okay. Uh, that's very subject to check. Just a, so this is kind of a refresher on the caps. So how these caps work um, is it is based on the revenue, the revenue requirement from our most recent rate case. So in the most recent rate case, the revenue requirement was four hundred eighty-one million dollars. And if you're taking two percent of that, you come into nine point six million. So the question becomes. How much can you spend in any three-year period to make revenue go up by 9.6 million? So, if we are putting in 88.7 million dollars of of investment, by the time you take out the depreciation, um, you've got the taxes and everything, you've got the return on it. It comes out to an increase of revenue of 9.6 million. So, Commissioner Harvey, your uh the current commission allowed pre-tax rate of return. Um, is that based on the rate case? And if it is, how do you get from the rate case number, which is not that number, to that number? So it is, um, oh, well, well, wrong button. Um, so 8.46, oh, Kelly, you might have to help me with this one because you take the- It's gross up for taxes. Yeah, I was gonna say it's the taxes. <clears throat> Impact. And I could send you that calculation if you'd like to. Anybody wants to see that, um, but it's the it's the tax effect. So is it one over one minus the tax rate? I think so. So it's if the if if the commission allowed rate of return I think is six point nine something. Six point eight five six. Okay. <laughs> I think you you divide it by one. Or, yeah, I'd have to look at the formula. It's uh, just yeah. grossing up for if you collect that amount of revenue, you're going to need to cover income taxes for as well. So. Um, there's also a five percent. There's a five percent cap, and that is that cap is saying how much can we spend on the program altogether. So, um, five percent cap. Of, of spending um, to get us to 24 million, that equates to about 221 million of of investment before the program would would top out, <coughs> would reach the cap. Um, remember too that it is based on the most recent rate case. So if there is a time when that revenue goes up in a rate case, the caps also go up again. Um, right now, with all of the spending that we're doing, everything is, is under the caps. Um, this is, this kind of illustrates where the money's at and where it was falling off. So in February of 22, this is when rates went effective. It's not when we filed for it, it's not when we spent the money, this is when rates started to be collected. So in February of 22, there was a rural expansion tracker mechanism filing uh, for 20.9 million. And that one you can see drops off in February of 2025. The next time that rates went into effect for one of these was in January of 23, and that was when the general rate case was effective. So there was $23.6 million of uh, revenue that was collected for rural expansion in, in that docket. 
And then just recently uh, in February of 24, there was another rural expansion tractor mechanism and that one will drop off at the end in February of 27. So then you can see that as, as that first tracker mechanism falls off in 25, this new one uh, you'd see for Genola will, will go into effect. So it's, it's on that three year rolling thing, everything's falling off every three years. Any questions on that one? And that's that's your five percent cap, right? So this is the this is the two percent. So the five percent would be all of these added up. So in total, you can't spend more than five percent. Is that ever? Does this legislation Forever. keep going in perpetuity? It goes. Yeah. It, there's not a no sunset. No sunset. Right. Commissioner, did you have a question? Commissioner Hart. Yeah. Thought I saw it out of the corner of my eye. Any other questions on? caps okay looking forward we've we've spent some time like a, like considerable time looking at different projects that we can do and we've looked at should we be doing um, should we be doing a big project like um, I don't know trying to reach like a canab kind of a thing which there's people who really want to do it in, in, in the company but the way that the caps work and how long it would take us to get down there, it'd be like covering several rate cases. And, and you'd be getting really presumptive on how much revenue is going to increase and where your caps will be. It's kind of a, I don't know if it's going to work. So what we've, we've been looking at is, is what other communities could we reach? And um, these aren't in any particular order. Um, but these are kind of some of the leaders right now, some of the communities that we've been looking at, um, at serving. And you can see this is a, a population number. It's not necessarily a, a number of customers. It's just the, the population of that community. They each have pros and cons, whether it's, a, it's already an incorporated city, whether it's, if it's close to our existing system, um, as we've looked at it, we could do a lot of these. If you did them in the right sequence, you could stay under the caps and and do quite a few of these of these projects. But that would be over um, you know a period of, of years, maybe ten years, and you'd be doing um, even multiples multiple projects a year. So. That's kind of where, what we're looking at right, right now is we think we can get the most bang out of doing some of these smaller projects and doing more of them and reaching more communities in more counties and um, bringing gas to more people. Hey, will you go after the question? I, don't, I think you have the question. Go, go back to the first slide with the community count. So I pull up the testimony. So Eureka was 360. And Goshen, Alberta, the community leaders actually told us 340, and we did a Google map search and thought it was going to be 317. Um, so they were turned out they were right. Um, but that that was what our, our initial estimates were for those two. Thank you. Questions on those? So, um, so what is the uh, guiding objective? Is it more proximity? Is it more number of customers? Is it uh, staying in one geographic area? There's, there's a number of things that we're looking at. I don't think that we're looking to stay in one geographic area necessarily. Um, what we're looking at is we, we do look at the, the cost and how many customers you bring on. It, the legislation doesn't lay out that that's got to be a consideration, but Know, to keep it reasonable, I think that that should be a consideration. <coughs> we're looking at that. When we were looking at Canab, you'd have to put an office down there, right. and so because it's not within an hour driving distance of anything else on our system, so so being close to our, our existing system is is something that we look at. We're looking at if there's a potential for 
uh, commercial or industrial growth, or even if the community of residential growth, if, if they, we think there's going to be that. Um, I was on a recent call, and they were talking about Apple Valley, it's not on this map, down in the St. George area, that is has the potential to really take off with residential mm -hmm. growth. So th this is subject to change, I, I should point that out, that uh, we might add things, we might take things off, because as we're going through and we are looking at, you know, where's the where's the growth happening? Can I add to that? Please. Eric, you may recall from some of these other dockets that we also um, collaborate very closely with the community leaders there, the mayors or, or city councilmen or county councilmen, and gauge how much community support we have. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in addition to all the things that Austin has just listed off, we want to go to communities that want gas service. And you can see from the uptake that we've achieved that. That's part of the deal going forward as well. We'll be reaching out to all of these, um, the, the, the leaders, and then also holding um, community meetings in all of these communities as time goes on to make sure that if we're going to spend the money, people are going to want the service. Gotcha. Are there enough contractors to uh, keep putting the pipes in for you? Yeah. I think, uh, I think a lot of what we've been doing is um, is the same. Uh, we, it goes out to bid, but it's, it's a lot of times the same contractor mm -hmm. who's doing it. And um, we haven't, we've had, haven't had any issues with that. Commissioner? I'm just curious about if, if the company has considered some type of a stakeholder process in terms of looking at these potentials, like involving the division or the office as, as part of your state. You've talked about, you, you talked to apparently cities and towns, uh, that it might be useful to get some other perspectives yeah. in the selection process. We haven't done that in the past. Um, I don't think I don't think I have any. I mean, just off the top of my head, any reservations with meeting with with stakeholders and saying, you know, these are what we're looking at. Is there any information you'd like to to see before we start going down that road? Mm -hmm. That'd be probably helpful. I mean, in a way, we we kind of do do that just because we get pre approval. We don't we don't extend until we've we've approved it with the commission and, and have the division office look at it. So, but yeah, I agree with you. I think it makes sense to involve them earlier in the process. Good idea. Anything else on this one? My next and last slide is, is pretty generic um, because we're, we're, we really are pushing right now to try and figure out what the next community is. Um, so I would think that, so right now we are reaching out to communities and, and seeing if there is interest. We're working on communicating with them and trying to gauge where these communities are at um, with, with their leaders. And then once we've kind of made up our mind, sometime during the second quarter, we'll be out canvassing and talking with customers and um, doing the community meetings, those kinds of things to kind of announce that we are coming answer any questions, make sure that the right information is getting out in front of the customers. And then probably sometime third quarter is when you'd see an application to for pre-approval to extend to a new community. And then 2025 we would begin building. On the list that you have, is there any front runners or um the the one I think that, I don't know, generally, okay to... Yeah, I mean, I all, so. all of it is, is um, subject, to, subject to change. change. Sure. Yeah. I think Portage was was one that was that was being considered pretty highly. Um, that is just south of the Idaho border. Um, and so it's a, it's, and it's not a really big extension to, to get up there, and it's a smaller community. It wouldn't be a really big project. Um, the last call I was on, they were talking about that, and then but there were a couple of questions with land rights and, and things that were in that area. So they, they're they looking at that one, but they also were looking at, um, it, there wasn't a specific community, but they were looking at saying, if that's such a small one, 
could we do two in the year and, and add another community? So they're kind of looking at that and and trying to figure out if there's another one that they could that they could do. So Portage was the the most recent top runner. That's everything that I've got on rural expansion. If anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer those. And then up to the All right. nice guy with no hair. <laughs> <laughs> what Austin didn't point out is the fact that when I started doing these, I was full. <laughs> <laughs> it's just been that long, I guess. Either that or it's that stressful that I lost all my hair. All right, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our transportation and storage planning, right? So kind of not necessarily everything we're doing this year or anything like that. I'm going to talk about our contracts, but we got to keep in mind we're also looking longer term. So I put this slide together, and it's kind of a weird looking slide if you just look at it, but it's it's really our strategy. And the idea here is that we're, we're trying to balance, you know, cost effective and, and reliable, right? We want our supply to be cost effective. We want it to be reliable. We want to make sure that we can get our gas here when we need it, and that needs to be at a good cost. So we, a, a couple of factors that we look at, and I've kind of moved them on this sliding scale, nothing's exact here, but just to kind of show, you know, whether it's more, you know, if that kind of is more on the reliable side, the cost efficient side, a lot of it you see is right here in the middle, where we're really trying to balance the both. But the, the first thing is that we want to use firm transportation capacity. We want to have control. We want to make sure that contract is there, that that gas is going to flow from where we buy it to where it gets delivered to our city gate. So I've kind of pushed that one a little more towards the reliable side of the spectrum here because we want it to be firm, that, that capacity. We want to make sure that that is, is cost effective, but the, the firm part's is what I wanted to really emphasize. Uh, the next is getting us access to diverse supply points. This one's right in the middle because I really think that does both, right? If, if you have a lot of points that are spread out where you can buy the gas, it gives you the flexibility to buy it in one place if it's cheaper over there at the time, buy it in another place if it's cheaper over there at the time, right? It gives you that flexibility just like if it was your own portfolio, you have, um, you know, different things you can kind of switch between. That That's... The, the diversity of supply points, but it also has a reliability point of it, right? If it's really cold or if something happens in one area and you had all of your supply coming from that particular area, you're not going to be as reliable as if you spread it out and you have, you know, a couple of different places that you can buy the gas. So we really look at the, that diversity there from both sides of it. So that's right there in the middle. Storage capacity I put in the middle as well because same thing. Right? Your storage capacity is what you rely on either if things go bad, if there's problems out there, you're going to pull out of your storage. But also, if prices go really high, you want to make sure you're pulling out of your storage. So I've got that, secure, that storage capacity right in the middle there as well. And then hedging. I've got hedging more on the cost efficient side because most of, of why we're hedging is to make sure that we kind of offset any of those big major price spikes, right? We're not... We're not really trying to pick winners and losers kind of thing. We're, it's really more of an insurance policy. So I've got on the cost efficient side, but built in with that, there's some reliability. So I didn't push it too far on the cost efficient side because a lot of the hedging that we do is through physical gas contracts at a fixed price. So the fact that we have those contracts locked in, they're delivering them to us every day. There's a bit of reliability associated with that as well. So that's why you see most of this stuff is a little bit off to the center, but most of it's right there in the center trying to balance the two, cost efficient and reliable. So a lot of stuff going on on this. Uh, I tried to do, not just have a simple chart like we've always had. Uh, what this is, is our existing transportation contracts. Uh, you'll notice up here now we've got uh, both uh, the Williams and North, or Mountain West Pipeline and Northwest Pipeline are both owned by Williams now. Uh, that's just what it is, and then in the middle here, I've got Kern River, so you can kind of follow those uh, down all the way. Our Mountain West Pipeline contracts, we've got our 2945, which is a seasonal contract. Uh, that goes through 2027. We've got uh, our 241, that's our biggest contract, that goes through 2027. Uh, the the 100,000 that we added on, that's 6136, that's what gets us to um, that uh, Whitney Canyon capacity, also through 2027. And then uh, the other contracts there, there's a small one on overthrust. This is actually overthrust pipeline, which is 
Mountain West Overthrust Pipeline. Um, that one is through 2027, and then 2361, which is our Indianola capacity, also 2027. Now, that gives us a lot of flexibility come 2027. I don't know, I, I kind of wish we would have gone out 20 years or something like that, because, you know, back when we did this, like five whatever years ago it was, I was like, oh, 2077, that's a long ways away, that'll be someone else's problem. Well, it looks like it's still going to be my problem. We're still going to be looking at it. Um, but a lot of that capacity does come up. It is locked in through 2027. Gives us plenty of time. We'll, we'll be looking at that. Our current contracts, about the same same timing. Uh, we do have <clears throat> this 2020 20029 has a little bit that's seasonal. Um, the 33,000 is all year long. 50,000 is seasonal. Uh, goes through 2028. That gives it a little longer, but still all kind of matching up for us to, in that same time frame, really reevaluate what we want to do. I don't see a lot of changes. That's kind of the, the punchline is I, I, I like what we have here. I don't see a lot of changes. There might be a little mixing and matching, but I don't see a lot of changes. Um, the small 20039 contract goes through 2027. Uh, these three, if you remember, those are, uh, we've listed them in the past as a release. We have, we, we did a permanent release through a party that really gets us that. And it's a little confusing here with the November, March, and November and March, December. Basically what it means is that in the months of November, so on the, the two bookends, it's seasonal. So in November, and on the other side, March, we have 33,000 in capacity. And then uh, during December through February, we have all three of these. So it's what, 89, 925 um, for those core winter months. So it just really is a shaped kind of, um, which is great. We love these seasonal contracts because our load is very seasonal, right? We, and, and that's why we've, we've done some of those. These, this one that is all year, I'd like to point out that um, that contract has been uh, really useful in that in the summer we've released the capacity on that uh, to other parties, uh, particularly moving to California, and we've we've made out really well on that contract. Uh, so much so in that I think we've released it for enough that basically pays for the whole contract year round. So it's been uh, really good for us. Uh, going to Northwest Pipeline, um, this is all really these three contracts right here are really just one contract. Um, it's for uh, 4,311, I think the, the math comes out to be. But what we do, that's this base contract right here. We actually release kind of part of it to ourselves and we can segment it. It's a way that, that we can segment the capacity and use it uh, a, a little bit more going both ways. It gets us a little extra capacity um, without having to have another contract. Uh, so it just extends what we have. We use that mainly to serve like uh, Moab, Monticello, Arches, stuff like that. That's served by Northwest Pipeline. Okay, now we'll get to some of the, the new stuff, the colored stuff, the, the changes. This is um, what we really want to talk about. This right here doesn't have a contract number. It's, uh, you'll, you'll recognize the name, but it's a, the Rickman Creek Loop. It's a precedent agreement. So uh, there was an open season Northwest Pipeline did last year, and uh, we bid into that open season, and we actually got 25,000 decatherms of capacity on Northwest Pipeline. Uh, what we actually plan to use that for, and I'll show you here later, I'll draw some of this out on a map and kind of show you where all this is going, but we plan to use that capacity when it comes in. We don't exactly know when it's gonna end because we don't know exactly when it's gonna start. Um, it's, it's set to begin either December 1st of 2025 or 2026, depending on their construction and they, which type of permit they can get. There's there's a couple different type of permits they're working on. I'm waiting uh, this week. I'm going to get an update as to which one, but that'll start either planned for December of, of 25 or 26, and then we'll have it for 10 years. So that's why I just kind of put 10 years on. So this is an expansion. Of so this is an expansion that they've done to access. Some of it was to access Rickman Creek the old Rickman Creek uh, storage facility. It's now Spire Storage, but um, it was to access that. But in there, it gets us capacity. This is actually capacity we're gonna have going from the other direction. It's pipe so, capacity. Pipe oh. capacity. So it's not storage capacity. This is pipe capacity coming from Stanfield, Oregon. So we're actually gonna have 25,000 decatherms from Stanfield, Oregon down to, uh, we're gonna bring it into Mountain West at Crossover 16. We don't have a direct connect off Northwest, so we have to, bring it into another pipe. 
But this goes back to that diversity of supply points, right? That different access points. So if something's going on east of us, like back in URI days, you know, something's going on east, we can bring in then gas that we can now, 25,000 decatherms, we can bring from kind of the other side, you know, further west of us and bring that gas in. So hoping that either, you know, if there's a supply reliability issue or something like that, we've got gas from a different area, or if it's just pricing is, is way up on in the mid-continent like URI, now we've got access to 25,000 of supply that's not as impacted by that pricing, that geographic price. So you're bringing that in to Brigham City? Or? Uh, no, it'll come in on Northwest Pipeline. Northwest Pipeline interconnects with Mountain West, so it'll tie back into other capacity that we, we have. So we have to put it onto a different pipe, but um, for it'll still get us access to the supply is what we really and want. There's enough capacity on Mountain yeah. West as well. Mm -hmm. But again, we wouldn't be buying it at Mountain West pricing, which would could be impacted by things like in the Midcon. We're buying it at you know, Oregon pricing, which has gas coming in from different areas. So that was kind of the point of, of that one there. Um, if we look here, we've got our firm peaking. I've got this in orange. Uh, you'll notice those firm peaking contracts on Mountain West, uh, they were a three-year deal. They expired. Um, they're, they're just seasonal, right? So they went from middle of November through middle of February. Uh, this February, they ended, and we're, we've got to get some new numbers to them, how much we need. And we're working on that extension. We'll probably do another three uh, to five years. I worked with um, uh, this one, the Kern River firm peaking, same thing. We really just extended that out another five years. The difference there, and we want to do the same thing over here, is if you notice, this one ended, this one will end on 228. Working with our gas control, you know, we started those contracts in mid November and went to mid February. They've kind of pushed on us for the past couple of years. We really want those to start the beginning of November and the end of February. We've still got a lot of cold weather, especially lately. It seems like early November has been a lot colder than it was for a while. So they're going to go from November 1st all the way through the end of February. It just made more sense. Um, so we did that. We, in order to do that with Kern, we had to extend it out five years instead of three. Um, but we did that. and. And that one has recently been recontracted, so it'll go through 2029. The other one is probably going to be either a three-year or five-year, uh, but we're looking at doing the same thing. Just continue with what we've been doing. And then down here, no notice. Uh, our no notice on Mount West has not changed. So that's kind of just a recap of all of our contracting. We're going to get a little more, a uh, little more talking about, um, I guess, bigger picture in a second here. Uh, now storage. Uh, same thing with storage here. The blue is existing contracts that are in place through 2025. We'll be working on this uh, 997 one this year. You'll uh, see an update to that in the IRP, but we're, we're going to want to renew that. Storage is in high demand right now. Um, I think it's pretty clear that we, we want to keep those clay bakes in storage. They're very much in demand. It's fully contracted. Uh, nobody else could. <laughs> if, if, we, if we turn this back, there'd be a long line of people that want it. Let's, let's say that. Um, the, we just did this one last year or, or in October, I guess that's last year because it was 2023. That was renewing our 935. Same thing. Commissioner Harvey? How long will they let you renew them for? <laughs> they will, they would like us to go longer. So that's something that we can look at is do we want to, we've kind of gone with this approach. If you notice, uh, you know, 2027, 28, 29, we've kind of gone with this approach where We've alternated them so that every year we have that flexibility to change if we wanted to. The, the pipeline, they would love us to go longer, right? But we've kind of just been doing this five-year term. Um, if, if you have feedback that you'd like us to go longer, we can, we can contract these. The, the one thing I will say is we do have uh, ROFR rights, meaning right of first refusal. So when they do expire, if for some reason they didn't, want to renew them for us for some reason and they went out to somebody else and bid them to someone else we could then um re we, we have the right of first refusal we could then turn around and say and if someone else came in and said well they're, they're at max rate so if someone came in and said we're going to do 20 years then we could turn around and say no we'll, we want to keep it and we'll do 20 years so we have that ability to so 
we've just been kind of doing five years just to kind of keep them staggered. Um, it just makes more work for me, to be honest, because <laughs> it means every year I've got to look at another one. But I kind of like having that flexibility every year and keeping them staggered like that. In, in fact, they, I talked to them this morning because we were talking about um, these contracts here, which we'll get to in a second. And we actually, they, they said they would love it. We could, if we wanted to, we could combine those three contracts into one. Um, but right now, where they have different years and everything, I think we're going to kind of keep things the way they are. Um, bringing us to the aquifer contracts with them, that is one where we they kind of just filed for a uh, a change in their tariff, which we didn't argue because it's actually going to uh, simplify some things for us. All the terms are going to remain the same. But these three contracts, because they've all always had the same end year and everything, they're actually combined that into, they, they changed their tariff and it kind of created this contract change. But they're all going to be one contract now um, with the flexibility now for us to, we don't have to nominate out of each one separately and say put this much gas in this one and that one. They're going to operate them as one facility even though they're three separate storage. So it's going to be one contract all operated as one. It's going to, from a scheduling standpoint, it's going to make our lives a little bit easier from a flexibility standpoint, I think it makes their lives a little easier. So um, not much changes from a contracting standpoint. We still have the ability if we said, oh, well, we just we want to keep one of these and get rid of the other two or vice versa. We still have the ability, same recontracting terms, same price, everything. We could just then say, well, we want to drop off, you know, some inventory or we want to drop off some deliverability and it would be the same as getting rid of a contract. So it doesn't, from a contracting standpoint, we're not losing a lot of flexibility. I, I honestly think it's gonna create more work on their side and they're not gonna like it. <laughs> but from our side, it gives us a lot more flexibility. So they're combining those. Um, you have a question? Yeah, so from a physical standpoint, as I remember, those three aquifers are not connected to another pipeline. They're just a couple of miles down from the city gate. Right, they're connected via Mountain West Pipeline. They're, it's kind of, you know, driving from here, you get to Colville, right? Right after Colville is Chalk Creek, right after Chalk Creek is, is Lee, well, Leroy, I think, is actually just past on, Evanston. The, on the Wyoming side of things, but it is a little further up, but yeah. same pipeline. But they're not, they're not feeding any other system, except through backhaul or something like that. Right, yep. Um, have you ever thought about just trying to buy those from Williams? Put them back on your system. Check my wallet. See if I can. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we haven't, but it is definitely something that we should. I, I haven't heard if there's been any talks about buying them. We are the only uh, shipper in all those facilities. Uh, we do contract for them, but I don't know. They'd want us to buy all the pipes downstream mm -hmm. of there too. That would have be... all the integrity stuff and. That would be the tricky point. I don't know if, I don't think anybody else has, I don't think there's any production that comes in anymore in between Leroy and us. So, you'd but they also, do. You'd also need a reservoir engineer to, to manage. I mean, you're, you're now getting into interstate pipeline operations and standing up an organization to manage three storage facilities. So I don't know from a cost benefit standpoint if it's worth it. Well, and also I think the bigger issue is probably, you know, Colville is probably easier. There's no pipes that interconnect, but they do, Mountain West has a, the pipe coming down from Whitney Canyon does interconnect to their main line in between um, Leroy yeah. and the city gate. So that would definitely complicate it a little bit. That would, yeah. Because um, then do you have to buy that one all the way up there? And that that's, you're gonna create more. But I think Colville is probably the simplest if you were gonna go that route. Um, but I think buying all three, I, I haven't been in any discussions on that. Uh, and then this one over here is in green. Uh, we're actually really excited about this. This is our Spire storage contract. If you remember, we had a Rickman storage contract back when Peregrine owned them. Uh, that contract expired, and right after it expired, things kind of like pricing went crazy, became a lot more volatile, and we wished we still had 
that contract. Well, they did an open season this past year, um, and we do now have another two BCF with uh, 22,000 withdrawal. It's actually got 18,000 injection per day and deliveries into Mountain West Pipeline. That's on that lateral I was just talking about that, that connects in um, at Whitney Canyon. If we go back, that's where the, oops, that way, that's where this kind of fills that 100,000 of capacity right there. That's on that lateral right there. So um, super nice to have that. We're excited to have it. It's empty right now because we haven't started the contract. And with low prices this uh, going on right now, we plan to start injecting here in, uh, April 1st and, and getting some of that uh, low, nice low price gas into that storage. So um, I know we've talked in here a lot about you know wanting more storage in terms of our hedging, in terms of supply and reliability, in terms of everything. Storage right now is in very high demand. So we were, we were pretty happy to get this, um, this extra storage contract put in there. All right, so let's talk kind of a little bit bigger picture here and then I've got a map that we're going to kind of tie it all together and I'll show you where everything is but as we look further down the road again this is you know now we're getting outside of just strictly we're going to sign up for this contract tomorrow because a lot of it is we have to be prepared for things we have to wait for an open season wait for the pipelines to really offer the capacity before we can just sign up for it we a lot of times we're not going to a pipeline saying hey we want a, a hundred thousand and they've got it right there on the shelf, shelf that we could buy, right? They've got to have projects planned. And this is kind of how we find out about them. So I uh, went to the Williams customer meeting recently and they talked about this project. Um, I had their permission to, to use this, uh, this picture from their slide over here. Um, I hope you don't mind if that actual picture is not in the IRP because it is there from their slides. So the information will be in there. Hopefully everybody's okay with that. Um, but really what the what we want they have no available capacity to our city gates right now Like I said, they don't have anything on the shelf if we want more capacity. They don't have it They are fully subscribed to our city gates So we've got to kind of look down the road at what they might have and this project here is one that they've looked at and They're saying Q4 of 2027. They want to do a Fiddler expansion project. So uh, If you don't know where this is, here's our Great Salt Lake right here this is the Uinta Basin out here, right? So one place that we've looked at for where we want to get more gas is the Uinta Basin. There's a lot of drilling that can go on out there, but really right now there's a lot of constraints. There's, you know, because they actually have some stuff here. Their system is kind of set up weird right now where they've got pipes separated here that actually flow down this way, go out that way, go through some processing plants because they've got to process it all. And then it comes back this way. So it, they've kind of got some weird stuff going on there. They've got some other projects that are trying to get rid of some of the bottlenecks to get gas this way. And then this Fiddler compression is what brings it back over here. So they've got to do some Fiddler uh, compression expansion. But really it's just to get the Uinta Basin growth. So production growth here in Utah uh, over to uh, Goshen, which is where it connects with Kern River. We happen to, to tap in right here at our uh, pacing gate. So we could get some of that Uinta Basin, Utah production uh, to us. They, this project would bring about 99,000 decatherms of additional capacity. They'd have an open season, we'd have to bid on it. This isn't something where you know, they're just gonna build it for us. This is something that we're gonna have to bid on an open season and everything, but they're saying right now, it's a potential project for 2027. There is no open season, I can't just sign up for it or anything. but as we've asked for long term, this is the kind of stuff we look at long term. Eric? When you bid for it, how does that how does that work? Because uh, on so if you do a Mac request our pipeline, we use bid max rate, right? The most they can take. So then they what they do is a net present value, right? So if you if everybody bids max rate and somebody bids three years, and somebody bids max rate at eight years or ten years, that's what's gonna gonna move the needle is the net present value. So longer term then is what gets you. Um, the other thing that does is, if you'll see in our IRP that one of the places we're growing our Wexpro production, where they're drilling Wexpro right now, is in this Uinta Basin area, is, is in the island fields and stuff like that in the Uinta Basin. So while, while I said there's a lot of drilling there, some of it's actually our Wexpro drilling. So 
this gives us access, more access to that. So we're actually really excited about the potential of this project. And if you talk to our system planning guys, they, they really like the, the idea of having more supply coming in at Payson on the southern end of our system where we built that, uh, you know, the high pressure 720 feeder line that comes out of Payson. They would love to get more gas from Payson. So. Uh, same, since we're talking about Williams, uh, Northwest Pipeline, again, I talked a lot about that uh, access to supply from Stanfield, that new 25,000 contract, and we're continuing to, to work with them to see if there's any other uh, any other possibilities out there. But that was kind of the one that, that did come up, the one that we saw on our horizon that, that we really liked. Okay, so now let's talk about tall grass. This is probably a a new sounding pipeline to some of the people in here. I know we haven't talked too much about them. Uh, the two main pipelines they now own are, that we, we would deal with anyway, is Ruby Pipeline, used to be owned by Kinder Morgan, uh, Tallgrass Bottom, and uh, Rex. So let's, let's table Rex for a second and just talk about Ruby. And we've talked a lot about Ruby in here for years, because I remember even in system planning we started talking, when I was in system planning, we started talking about Ruby. And we actually, that when they were building Ruby, this makes me feel old that all these contracts on Ruby are expiring and I remember when they built Ruby Pipeline. Uh, we put in a valve. We didn't build a station, we bought some property, we put in a valve, kind of a just-in-case scenario. I think we're getting closer to that point where we want to really start talking about building that station there. Um, and not because I want to pay their current max rate of $1.14. Um, they still have a high max rate. Um, but we, we think there's potential for negotiated rates. Talking to them actually yesterday, we, we definitely think we could, we could look, if we did do a longer term contract, we could look at some negotiated rates. So I don't know what that rate is yet, but that's kind of the, the route we're going at is maybe some negotiated rates, maybe even, you know, um, if we do have to go and not do firm, we could buy delivered. There's some other things we could do there, but I think there's a lot of advantages and, and talking to system planning guys, they think there's some operational advantages to us starting to look at building a gate. So you may see, again, long-term planning, right? Don't, don't say it's on the books for next year, but we are looking at now um, potentially moving forward with, with at least exploring that uh, gate station off Ruby. That would be in Brigham City. Um, the, so one thing I wanted to point out about that pipe is they actually have over a BCF of unsubscribed capacity on that pipe. So like I was saying, where Mountain West is fully subscribed, Kern River fully subscribed, um, this one's not. So this, this pipe was designed to take gas to Malin, Oregon, uh, basically on the northern border of California, and it is not flowing full right now. It starts so, at Opal? Uh, yeah, it starts around Opal, yep. And so over here, we have all their contracts, and I've highlighted a few of them. Uh, I don't know if you can see all the dates, but other than the ones I've highlighted here, Cascade, which is only 15,000, that one expires in 2037, so that's a long-term contract, but it's only 15,000 decatherms. Uh, this other one is Nevada Gold Mines, and this is all public information, it's on their website, I'm not giving away any secrets or anything here. Um, Nevada Gold Mines, that one goes through 2027, but that's only 8,500 of capacity. And then uh, PG&E has the only other long-term contracts which uh, I think that equals, what did I say, 325 is I think what it comes out, 325,000 decatherms of capacity. That all expires in 2026. Everything else on their pipe expires in 2024. It is short-term capacity. And then on top of that, you've got over a BCF of fully unsubscribed. So not only are they not flowing full, they're flowing fair, they're pretty empty. So they're, this is why they just got, I think, the, the pipe went bankrupt is what I believe what happened and uh, Kinder sold it to, to Tallgrass. So Tallgrass is trying to find some different things to do with the pipe. They're trying to look at you know other ways to utilize it, basically ways to sell that capacity. So we're gonna, we're gonna start looking uh, at this with Tallgrass. So it's kind of the beginning phases of conversations, but again, I wanna start bringing it up. But it is interesting that there's some big pipe, it is designed to flow from east, from, from Wyoming, Opal, all the way to Malin, Oregon. So, you know, do they switch it around and make it so it can move other directions? I don't know, they're, they're, they're looking at different things. So, one thing that is useful about this 
though, is that uh, it has access to Spire Storage West. So um, remember I said I, we, we bid in that open season, we got a new contract through that open season. Well, they recently had a different open season, but we did not participate in that one. We looked at it. The reason we didn't participate in that was the fact that um, they only had two options for deliveries. One was into Kern River, and one, which was off their painter lateral. So it was a lateral that we don't have capacity on, um, and we wouldn't have been able to really get that capacity through that lateral to our system and be firm, or through Ruby Pipeline. So Ruby connects directly to Spire. So it would give us access to more storage opportunities at Spire. So again, another reason to kind of look at this. Um, Rockies Express Pipeline. So this is the pipeline, and again, I'm gonna kind of overview all of this real quick on a map to kind of show you where everything is, but it kind of made sense to do it after. Ruby Express Pipeline goes all the way to the east, <coughs> east side. I think it ends in Carthage, Pennsylvania. So um, we're still looking at that for possibilities to, again, diversify our supply, get further east, get into some of that Marcellus gas, um, which oftentimes, if, if you looked at last year, much cheaper than than what we were buying here in the West, right? Again, that, that concept of diversifying for multiple reasons, this capacity could get us there. We have to see you know, what becomes available, what price it becomes available it as, but it is something that we are, are definitely watching is to get all the way there. And right now, there are some constraints, right? So Rex, Rockies Express Pipeline, it ends at about Wamsutter. So we're gonna have to bring it into another pipe. Either um, there are some couple of options with overthrust pipeline, we could maybe bring it in through Mount West Pipeline, CID, stuff like that. Or they can deliver down, they're working on some routes down to White River Hub where we could bring it to White River Hub, but then we get into our constraints on the southern system. So a lot of stuff to work out there in terms of getting the gas from there to here, but it is stuff that we're, we're looking at. And again, we want to keep you guys in the, the long-term big picture here. Sorry, are the rates on Rex pretty reasonable? Transportation rates? Uh, they're they're definitely higher. They're I, I don't I can't quote you exactly what they are, but we're not talking the 17, 18 cents that you're seeing on there. But their pipe flows both directions now. So it was originally designed to go from west to east, and then we had the whole shale gas Marcellus revolution, and they actually started moving east to west. So now their pipe can go both ways. So. It's a little more complicated than just saying the rate on their pipe is X, right? It's different, different from and twos have different rates and gotcha. um, so where you're going. So it's a little more complicated. All right, storage planning. So uh, again, the main one we've been talking with quite a bit is Spire because they seem to be the most active. Last year we talked a little bit about um, their Spire storage down in, in Oklahoma, and we, we explored that. They, they did have some open seasons, but there's really some capacity constraints um, between getting from there to here. So we'll keep an eye on it, see if we can get through. Again, it's like multiple pipes away. It's Oklahoma, right? It's not, not right here in, in Utah. So it is a little further, but we're going to keep an eye on that, see what we can make work. If something comes available that we can make work there, we'll, we'll do it. Um, but there's really, uh, I guess, our one new contract we have there, I talked about that. That was affiliate facility expansion. There's really two ways where we wind up having access to new storage. That's if it's all through an open season. Storage is going to put out an open season, right? Which means either somebody turned back capacity, which isn't happening a lot right now. There's not a lot of capacity getting turned back. Or uh, facility expansion. And... The open season we responded to was a facility expansion. The other one I told you about that we couldn't really participate in because of the, the constraints there, that was actually a turn back capacity. Somebody actually turned it back. And I think I, I think they turned it back. I think it was more Spire kind of wanted a higher price for it. So they wanted to be able to put it back in the market because uh, storage is, is in such demand. And these are like Spire has market based rates. So their, their rates will go up. Um, so they, I think they saw an opportunity to bring it back, put out an open season, and I'm sure they, they got good response to it. Um, again, that future Ruby station could facilitate some capacity um, or 
get us gas out of this storage facility. And then uh, we'll conti we're continuing to work with them, just like we are with everybody. We stay in con close conversations with them. Um, I uh, talk to Chad all the time. He's my kind of representative there that I work with, and he kind of keeps me abreast if, there, if anything new is coming up, and I tell him our needs. So we, we work a lot together. Uh, magnum storage. So we keep this on here. We keep, you know, it's it's still there, right? They're uh, they've been bought now, I guess, by Chevron. Uh, bought Magnum. We really haven't. I haven't heard much from them since the purchase. So I don't know if that is really changing things. Um, I've spoken to them the last time we talked. They were supposed to get back to me. It was a, a couple months ago now, but they're still trying to develop their their storage facility down there. For natural gas, the pro the latest problem that we came into is they don't have a pipeline connecting them. They're out there next to uh, you know IPA's power plant out there, and they they don't have a connection to Kern River. I want to say it's 20 miles or something like that to Kern River's pipeline. They they literally Kern River just built a pipeline to go from their main line to the IPA power plant. They built it sized for the power plant. There's no extra capacity in there. Magnum keeps telling me, well, talk to Kern River. They just built a new pipeline, get some capacity on that. There is no capacity. Kern keeps telling me there's no extra capacity on that pipe. So we would, in order to make this work, we not only have to, you know, pay for the facility to get expanded or built to, to provide storage. We're also going to have to build a pipeline just to get to Kern to backhaul it back to us. So definitely some challenges there but we're continuing they're trying to figure out a way to make it pencil out and make it work and we're trying to work with them to see if if there's something that we can do but there's there's some challenges with that one out there Eric first oh, thanks um, so how does that work do they do they build it and then you come or do no. you say if you build it we'll contract for X dollars and then so they use that to go to the bank and borrow money. That's the negotiating that goes on, right? They're, they, they're kind of looking at it saying, oh, and they haven't come back to us with, okay, here's kind of a price if, if you want X amount, how much. So we kind of go, with them, go to them with our needs. They should really come back to us with, okay, you know, we could build this for this price and, and kind of go back and forth. Um, they've had kind of an eternal open season for capacity out there, no specific rate or anything like that, no terms. Just kind of tell us what you need and we'll see if we can make it work kind of situation. So you kind of commit a contention on them building. Yeah, we, we would have to come to agreement to say, okay, we want you to build this for this price or, or we want to sign up for this much storage at this price and then they agree to do it. But they're not going to just, they're not just going to build it until they have, you know, contracts to support it. Commissioner Harvey. How, compared to these other storage facilities that you use, how, how big could they be? They could be pretty big. I mean, they, they've, they, it's, it's different type of, of reservoir, right? They're a salt cavern reservoir as opposed to depleted existing reservoirs. So size-wise, they can make it, like inventory-wise, I think they could probably be a few BCF. But it's a little different in that they could be really high deliverability, injection, withdrawal kind of thing. So there are some advantages there because they could just build it with that in mind, right? You don't have to spread it into a well like you, you do here. So it would be high deliverability. It would be, you know, as they like to say, Gulf Coast domal style storage. So a little bit. Current capacity, though, too. Yeah, but then you're restricted by the current capacity. That's a good point. But that's that's kind of their their sales pitch is that they can be very high turn rate, very high deliverability, high injection. Um, you just gotta work with the pipeline side of things too and, and everything. So it's ve very very uh, vague answer because it's a vague type situation. They don't have a a set. The, they'll they'll build they'll they'll build whatever it takes to get you into it. Right? How how do we get into this storage facility for for this price? Is, is basically what it is. Sorry, we'll add another. Do you have to, by some sort of FERC regulation or something, go to an interstate pipeline between the storage facility, or can you go straight from no. from that to your pipe? We could, yeah. We just have to build a long pipe. Yeah. 
you, you'd, you'd be looping Kern River quite a, quite a ways. We could go straight east, couldn't we, to the uh, San Pete Valley or something? Oh, and, and go like into our feeder line that goes yeah. down to, yep. Yeah. Granted, that's a 10 inch line. Now you've right. got, and, and not as much demand, so you're not getting tornado right. demand. There'd be problems. So. Yeah, I see no. That's an option as well. Yep. There's no, there's no requirement. I mean, if they were sitting right here in the Salt Lake Valley, we could go right onto our distribution system with, with no problem. So. Um, and then last one on here that I have is Mountain West Pipeline. We continue to have discussions with them, um, ongoing discussions, potential to expand. They're always looking for ways to expand Clay Basin, but they're. Oh, did you? No. They're, they're also, they've given us in the past, and I know we've talked about them in here, they've given us proposals to expand the aquifers. In the past, all that did was give us more deliverability, which, which would really just mean that we drain them a lot faster, which what we found back in URI is we could drain them pretty quick already. Um, so, and let, they, but they're, they've kind of gone back to the drawing board and they said they're looking at things for p potential for more injection along with deliverability so maybe we could you know put it back in quicker fill it up faster get it back I don't know what they're gonna come back with but we we continue those discussions I mean that's the general theme here is we we really are in ongoing dialogue at all times with all of these potential providers to see what they can get us that that would benefit us any questions on storage all right. Uh, oh, this is where I mentioned this, the salt lane, salt plains storage is not really viable. Uh, the other one, which we would love to get into, is Jackson Prairie. So that's uh, it's, it's actually got three owners or three owner operators, whatever they are: Puget Sound Energy, Vista, Williams. That's uh, it's up in Washington. Uh, great storage facility, very similar to Clay Basin. Um, it's fully subscribed. <laughs> so there is there is no room at the end there. We're we're not. I mean, we we keep an eye on it. If anything did come available, we would probably try and jump on it. This would come down from the other direction, right? This would go in nicely with some of our northwest um, capacity, or we'd have to look at more northwest capacity. That's kind of the only other issue with it. But but yeah, right now it's it's not out there. But we'll we'll continue to look at it. Um, I will say the when when we get to the as a preview for the next time you have to sit here through me is uh, our heating season review. Jackson Prairie had some uh, had some issues uh, on the one weekend of winter this year, so um, it, it went down with over a BCF planned out of it. So uh, it it made for uh, a lot of nervous people, not necessarily us, but we'll talk about that. That's a preview. That's kind of a trailer for the the heating season review, just to get you excited. <laughs> so when is that date again? Uh, April 23rd. Put it on your calendar. Now. How's that for coming right <laughs> off my memory? Right? That was back on, way back on like the first slot. All right, and then big red letters here. We're just going to continue to look at all of our, our viable options. We're continuing to really scour out there to see what, you know, try and get creative, everything we can do to make sure that, you know, we get Again, back to that first slide. Cost effective and reliable capacity to get our gas here and with, with both those things in mind. <laughs> all right, tie it all together. Uh, I think you've seen this, this little map before, but this kind of just brings it all home here. We, we sit right here. Uh, we've got a couple of dots on this map where we have our clay basin storage. I've added in our uh, spire storage. Along this blue line is where our aquifer storage is as well. Um, that's just us, so I didn't really put it on this, this map. Uh, over here is where that salt plains was. Uh, there, there's capacity constraints, I think, right in, in this area here, which is where we kind of got, got hung up on talking to some of those pipelines. Because we would have to go, this I believe is Southern Star Pipeline, that would have to go into Mountain West Pipeline, but there's some constraints on there that, that we're struggling with. So we'll keep an eye on it, but right now it's uh, not really uh, something we're doing. But, uh, looking here, I. There's a hand. Oh, Commissioner. Oh, I was going through your done, sorry. <laughs> uh, just where's Magnum on that map? Okay, Magnum sits right about here. Oh, thanks. Right out there. So the red is Kern River, right? Comes down from Opal all the way to California. So it sits off Kern River about here. So you'd have to get to Kern River's pipe and then backhaul back up to our main system up here. 
or I guess you could bring in a Goshen and around, but I, I think really we'd be coming up this way, so back calling on Kurt Rivers Pike. See, that's why I put this last, so you've kind of heard everything already, now I can draw it all together. Mm -hmm. um, the blue line here, this is Northwest Pipeline, right? So I talked about that capacity at Stanfield, Oregon. So that brings us in here. This is GTN's pipe, ties in there. Uh, actually does come from, uh, and there's an expansion plan, but it does come from uh, Kingsgate Hub, which is uh, coming from Canada. Uh, you've also got Ruby Pipeline here, which again, crosses our system right here, delivers it into Malin, which connects with GTN also. So all that's kind of tied in there, but we now have capacity to bring gas from here, which is you know isolated from, from this market, uh, bring it down in, into our market. Looking here, this green line is Rex. Again, it goes all the way over to Pennsylvania. So the idea there is if we did get some capacity on there, we could again, completely diversify where our supply is coming from, from a different area. Uh, down here we have the Permian. This was uh, El Paso's line. This is the one that uh, they had issues last year uh, where it was constrained and not as much gas getting into California. Uh, that's been resolved, not a problem. Uh, you can see Mountain West Pipeline kind of sits right in the middle of it, right? Connects a whole bunch of stuff, White River Hub, stuff like that. So just kind of giving you that overall picture of how things tie in. And that is all you have to hear from me, unless there's questions. Nothing? All right, I'm going to pass it on to Brandy, who's going to talk a little bit about our supply modeling. Thank you. And give you guys an update. I didn't get the memo on the hair. <laughs> we'll work on that for next time. All right, so I'm just going to go over our supply modeling because it is changing um, this year. Um, and what we use our modeling for, we use it um, a few different um, modeling processes. We use the um, Monte Carlo analysis for our RF, RFP and our IRP. Um, and we do that Monte Carlo analysis on pricing and weather. Um, for the IRFP, just to make sure that we choose the most economic supply packages. And then for the IRP, we input those supply packages um, to make sure that our system can meet the demand um, well into the future. And then on a weekly um, basis, we update a base um, model with the current weather and pricing just to make sure um, we're making the right weekly decisions regarding supply purchases, any storage activity, um, change in prices um, that could have been different from the IRP. And then we also use our modeling to analyze any um, existing opportunities that come up for gas purchases um, or storage capacities that's offered to us after the RFP or IRP have been completed. We previously have been using Sendout. Um, we use Sendout up until 2024, um, which is owned by Hitachi Energy. That contract is actually no longer active, and we have started using Flexos, which is an energy exemplar product. Um, we have been using that in our current weekly operational uh, modeling, and we will be using that for our 2024 20, 25 IRP. We have been um, using both models, um, you know, comparing them, the results. And one of the, just on this slide, it's just going to go over why we decided that we needed to make this change. Um, send out has not been updated since 2014 and there are no updates planned. We've had a lot of issues with their technical support. It's non-existent or been unsuccessful. Um, they have software and storage issues. We had a lot of issues with the, um, being able to run the Monte Carlo, very long runtime storage issues. Um, so that's why we looked into send out, which they are cloud-based, um, which improves our performance. They have enhanced cybersecurity. They have a great team of um, developers and programmers. Um, they also have, the program itself has improved input capabilities, which we have a better functionality to uh, model our Wexpar production, um, get refined um, input, refined demand areas, and they also provide more detailed um, results. 
So what does the new model do? Um, the old one didn't. It's actually pretty much the same as far as inputs and outputs go. You input the same things. We're inputting what we expect our Wexpro production to be, what the costs are, those total revenues. Um, as far as the tra pipeline transportation goes, it's the same capacity paths and costs, storage. Um, it's all the same capacity, in inventory, the contracts. And the model is actually going to give us the same outputs as well. Um, the daily demand, how that demand is met, you know, total system costs and um, supply shortages. We hope that there aren't any, um, but if it does, if there are any, the model will show us those outputs and then we can see what we need to do um, to remedy that problem. In comparing, um, so like I mentioned before, we have been comparing both models. Um, so, and we had, we went in, you know, we've been working on this for months, um, refining the Plexos model to make sure that it is giving us comparable results. Um, and then we used the same, you know, the operational model that we used in send out for the 23-24 IRP. The, um, the, this, the HDDs and the um, Wexboro production are both inputs that we put into the model. Um, so these were the same inputs that were put into send out and Plexos. Plexos. The demand in the clay basin inventory are outputs that both models have given us. Um, a little difference you see here is send out, they report their results are in a step function. So they group um, a certain amount of days together um, and Plexos is giving you the exact result for each and every day. Um, but as you can see that both models are giving us you know, pretty comparable results from the inputs that we put in. Any questions regarding this model comparison? Yes, sir. So the, and especially as kind of noted on the previous slide, but the, the change was mainly motivated by just the support and the ease of use as opposed to results being wrong or inaccurate readings or anything like that. Exactly. Right, yeah, send out was just really challenging. Um, and when you tried to get help and support, you know, we were told, you know, send out isn't making the company any money anymore. They don't have oh, any support. Okay. They can't, you know, they don't have developers that are currently or working on the product. Some people updated their windows and it just would not work <laughs> yeah. anymore. So it's that, like, that's a big risk. That was one of our <laughs> biggest concerns last year when we were doing the IRP with send out is anytime there was a security patch that you know our company keeps up with all the security cybersecurity, everything every time there was a security patch we were just waiting for one of them to just like send out no longer work with <laughs> with that update right because it had not been updated in so long it would just get locked out and and we oh, okay. were nervous about that all last year because we just hadn't had any updates to it so that was really the big drive and then another comparison that we did is we used the same normal um, base case that we used in send out for the IRP last year. And we input that information into Plexos. Um, and the total system costs, um, Plexos was 424.7 million. And send out that total cost was 428.6 million, which is actually you know, less than a 1% difference in those total costs. And we also modeled the Wexpro production. Um, Plexus was 56.1 million um, decatherms, and Sandout was 56.5 million decatherms as far as the total production. And it also was less than 1% of the difference. I thought you said Wexpro production was an input. It is an input, but it. it you you input what you the expected production is and then there are some there's line losses there's fuel there's stuff like that that comes in so that's why it, you know it kind of looks at shut-ins and stuff right so this is after all of that the shut-ins and all that we wanted to make sure it was still handling everything very similarly so any questions regarding the change in the modeling software you will? I think that's it, unless we have questions. I do want to give everyone an update on um, 
be under collective balance. So we, we just finished up February's numbers. Um, Will mentioned low gas prices. That was very helpful. So we're down to 135 million, which I can't believe I'm excited that <laughs> our under collection is 135 million, but that's down from 530 million last year. Um, and March, the good news with March, um, we're seeing gas prices in the dollar fifty range, and we have no contracts, no first a month, no fixed price. Um, so we're expecting March to be another um, big help to us. So I mean, at the, at the rate things are going, um, we're hoping to be able to come in in the summer and, and file a pretty sizable decrease. I uh, just want to give everyone an update on, on where we're at there, though. Don't jinx it. What's that? Don't yeah, that yeah. <laughs> Keep your furnace up. And, and Doug had a question behind you. Yeah. So during the conversation on storage, you didn't say anything about the LNG facility at all. Any reason for that? Because uh, we were really talking about contracted storage right now. We're not, I mean, it, it is what it is. It's, it's operating. It's there. Um, we could look at expanding it. That is something that we, we didn't include on there. But I was really looking at, you know, long-term storage contracts and everything not but um, I guess we there is a possibility we could expand the LNG uh, to, to actually be more than just supply reliability but we so haven't really looked at pricing on that or anything at this point and you don't really consider that as a resource to to use as a storage facility if you the way it is right now yeah. you know it, it's there for supply reliability we we could use it maybe, you know, at, at this point in the year, use some of it to, to withdraw out to if we had high prices in March or something. But unless we unless something went really crazy, I, I, I think we're holding it there for supply reliability purposes. I have a quick follow up to uh, Commissioner Harvey. You'd asked about that gross up factor. So we confirmed it's the gross up factor for the income tax is one over one minus the tax rate but it only applies to the equity portion. So you can't take the 6.86 gross it up. It's only 4.9% when you gross it up. That's why the math looked wonky. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Comments? Jokes? Okay, this concludes the technical conference. Thank you. Thank you. Let me say if anyone wants a number of my hairstylists. <laughs> <laughs>